Thank you. Oh. All right. Thank you. Howdy. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you. And uh, I, I'll start off with some of the basic rules. There's no uh, interrupt me at any time. I get to rant and rave and believe in some of this and don't know when to slow down, so I'll need you to kind of keep me on track. So if you have a question during the, during the time of the first, present, first part of the presentation anyway, then stop me and I'll, I'll go for a few minutes and then we'll open it up for question and response and give you time to talk about what's on your mind and not what's on my mind. Uh, and so when Annie called and said she would like for me to spend a few minutes with you talking about, uh, about things that mattered, I guess, is the way she described it to me career-wise, uh, and to spend some, spend some time maybe thinking about what works and what doesn't work. And she asked some very good questions at the end. Uh, how much of my success did I attribute to luck uh, was one of the questions that I had to ponder, I had to think about for a while because uh, were it not for God and luck, I would tell you that I probably contributed 0.0000001% of anything. Uh, and luck had a big part of it, but I think God position some of that so that uh, that luck happened because I think he had a plan for uh, for me that I didn't want to do. So uh, so I'll, I'll start off by just giving you some things randomly, some things that that have mattered to me and have mattered to to, to where I'm going to go. OK, uh, I'll start off by telling you that I don't believe in magic formulas. If you ever go to a session and somebody says, if you'll do these three things or these five things or these eight things, life will be good forever. You should run. Uh, as soon as you can because there's no magic formulas. Once you get out of here, the, about the only magic formula is you work your butt off. You gotta be the first one there, the last one to leave, and the one that works the hardest in between. And if you're willing to do that, then that's okay. I was always fortunate enough to be in that half of the class that made the top half possible. So I, I can do eight hours worth of work, but it takes me 12 to get it done. Uh, so I have friends that can do eight hours worth of work in four, and I always envied them, but uh, not, not me. I just had to, had to do more because I was in the slower group. Uh, whether it was redbirds or bluebirds, I was normally not allowed to play. No magic formulas, okay? And, and the second is I, I don't like motivational speakers. Uh, normally when you ever hear a motivational speaker, you just want to kind of wipe that stuff off. And I think mo most motivational talks have a great, great longevity of 12, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, and then most people go back to whatever they were doing. Intrinsic motivation works when you decide to do something you can and you will. Uh, and the third thing that I promise you is that I won't keep you over time because I know it's just now waking up time uh, and you got the whole night ahead of you and you got a whole lot going on. So, so I would never want to interfere with your, with your real life in the process. So I'll start off with some things that I've learned and uh, that I think that made a difference in my life. Uh, some of them not so long ago, but most of them a long time ago. And I attribute it to people that were some, uh, somewhat philosophers. One of my favorite philosophers was Yogi Berra, who was a baseball catcher and a uh, pro baseball catcher for years and years. And, and Yogi said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, and, and the whole concept of your future and the future uh, is something that's going to weigh on your mind for the next few years, the next few months, and hopefully you can put it off as long as you can. Uh, I, I crammed four years of college into 10. Uh, I would tell you that if there's any way you could stretch this out for seven or eight, you ought to do that. If you could find somebody to pay for it, uh, this is a great time in your life. Don't, don't rush through it. Uh, and the second thing is that the growth and knowledge depends entirely on disagreement. Uh, if two people have the same opinion, one of them is not needed. I, I was always fortunate to hang around people who would argue with me. I always worked for people who had the ability to say, I don't think so. Didn't be, they weren't argumentative. I mean, they weren't disagreeable, but you, you can disagree about the concepts because if two people have the same opinion, one of them really is not needed. So it's okay to disagree. It's okay to be different. And a friend of mine named Johnny Anitis, who is a, uh, he's a philosopher and he's an accountant and he is a, uh, a statistician and, and he's a thinker. Uh, and John said 92.3175814816 percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. Uh, I think John's number is a little low. Uh, so if you, if, if you listen to what most of the time you hear, hear on the media or see in the world, you'd probably agree that John's probably a little below the, little below the curve. And another guy whose philosophy I, I, I began to, to become enamored with about 50 years ago uh, was a guy named Einstein, not the bagel guy, the, the scientist. Uh, and one of the things Einstein said was that things should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. 
Now, now that sounds weird, I know, but here's what Einstein meant. He said, you don't achieve perfection with a process, with a product, with whatever you're trying to do when there's nothing else to add. You achieve perfection or close to it when there's nothing else to take away. When you get to the simplest form that something can be and functional, whether it's a process or whatever it might be, it doesn't get any better than that. So I would recommend that you spend time thinking about what could I remove? What could I take away? What could I not do instead of what could I add to something? Because it really does make it more gooder, I promise, if you can remove those things that are not necessary. My favorite people to hang out with are five years old. I love five-year-olds because they're masters of the most important question in the world, which is why? 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 And they can, they can stay longer than you can imagine and continue to ask you why until finally you say, because God said so. Uh, I'm not talking to you any longer. Just shut up and get out of my face. But they're masters at it. And then we beat it out of them. Uh, somewhere before they get to school, we beat them out of that concept, that process, and, and they, and they long, no longer ask why because they're told not to. And my grandfather always told me timing has a lot to do with the outcome of a rain dance. Uh, you're probably more successful if you pick a real cloudy day where the temperature is falling if you're going to do a rain dance than if you try an August day here where the sun's bright and it's 106. Your success is not very well. What he meant was you position yourself for success a long time before it's going to happen. You spend some time thinking about what you want to do. And you design where you want to wind up. You never design where you are. You never start from where you are to get something done. You start from where you want to be. You start from what you want to be. You start with what you want it to look like and you work backwards. And that's true in virtually everything I've ever experienced. And when you find people that can aid you in the process, it becomes, it becomes a much easier. Einstein always said great spirits have encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Most of the people who disagree and are disagreeable have not thought it through. And you really don't have time to spend with people who don't know how to think. Uh, it's not that difficult. And uh, even though we've been told not to, we're not, we're not supposed to re remember that forever. And Carl Sagan once said, uncertainty is the space in our mind where seeing begins. He was a great scientist. He was a, uh, he was a science fiction guy, but he was really a, a, a science realist for the most part. But the whole concept of uncertainty, that's where seeing begins. You're better at doing anything if you're not quite sure that you have it all down. When you're exactly positive that you can do it automatically, you're never as effective. So always introduce some uncertainty into what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to ask, where you're going to go. It's amazing how much more effective you can be. And Socrates says wisdom begins in wonder. It's okay to question. It's okay to ask. It's okay to decide. I don't really know yet. And Confucius, one more, Confucius says that, that learning, is, learning without thought is labor lost. Uh, that, that anything that you do without thought of the process, you, you wasted your time. So, so spend more time, spend more time thinking. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough at a very early age to have teachers that, that encouraged and demanded uh, that we spend more time thinking. And they also demanded that we spend more time with ourselves. Because I promise if you don't like being with you, no one else will either. Uh, and sometimes we have to relearn how to like ourselves, especially when you get to the age you are now, because there's so many conflicts, so many things that come at you from so many angles. Just remember the simpler you keep it, the easier it is to find the answers. So what do you know about future? About the future we're going to, the future that we'd like to go to anyway. Well, some things you probably already know better than I do, but we know that the future is not an extension of the present. It's not an extension of the past. The future is not this projected forward. The future is not what you put up with the last three or four or five or six years here projected forward. The future is undefined. And it's a whole lot easier to define it than it is to try to project it yourself into it. So the whole idea of, of, of the future, knowing it's not linear, it's not going to happen at the same time all the time. It's not going to happen at the same pace all the time. And one of the things that really is a determinant of the effectiveness of you in the future is how quickly you understand the value of time. Uh, Einstein used to lecture for hours and hours and hours about time, and I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about time. It's amazing when you're, when you're young, your age, you will trade your time for money. When you get my age, you will trade your money for time. 
At that point in your life where you realize that time has a greater value than money is what I call mental middle age. At that particular point, you begin to make totally different decisions. You begin to look further ahead. You begin to think about the futurity of the decisions you make now. And you begin to wonder more and you begin to question more. Question time. Question your spot in time. It's not linear. And you can't define the future for somebody else. You, you can't. You can't tell somebody what they ought to do, what they ought to be, where they ought to go, how they ought to get there. We have to find it ourselves. We can't get somebody to make a map for us. Can't be forced. And you can't make, put people into it. One of the things about leadership, I'm excited to see where, where a and finally moving in, in this whole leadership realm. We started off wrong in the leadership process. A guy named Peter Drucker, who was one of the greatest management gurus in the 20th century, uh, died at 105, I guess, two years ago and wrote some phenomenal books on management. Uh, but one of the things that Drucker said in a lecture one time was, leadership cannot be taught. It can be learned, but it cannot be taught. You cannot go to a seminar or read a book. You cannot teach somebody how to be a leader. First, you have to decide you want to become a leader, and then you can make it happen. Leadership cannot be taught. It can be learned. Uh, he also said in the same speech, uh, 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 it was about measurement for the most part. He said, I don't care what you do in this world. If you don't measure it, you don't understand it. If you don't measure it, you can't change it. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. If you don't measure it, you don't know if you're winning or losing. And that's true of life, you know. And a lot of folks don't understand or don't remember, but in the same speech, Dr. Drucker said, but there are some things in life that are too important to measure. So as soon as you can, figure out what's too important to measure and what's measurable for you to move forward. Uh, and it's easier to create the, the, the future than to predict it. Uh, and it's easier to live in that future and ask people to come live with you than it is to push them there. You can't push people to your future. You can design what you think is the coolest thing, but you can't push people into it. Now, you can live that way. You can become and people will come join you. So the way you create a future that you want people to be part of is that you create that future for yourself and you live there every day. You act that way, you do that way, you read that way, you talk that way, and you'll be amazed at what you attract. But you can't push people or force people into any future of any kind. And the last thing I would tell you is forever is not near as long as it used to be. Uh, you're learning that right now. Uh, forever in relationships doesn't last nearly as long as they did when you were in high school. Uh, forever in anything that you do doesn't last as long as it did. And that's okay. It's all right understand that when you enter into relationships, they are going to change. So the, the leaders that I've found, the people that have probably influenced me the most, uh, after Abby called, I start, sat down and started thinking about some of the characteristics. So I had to write down what I would tell you that I noticed in the people who influenced and continue to influence the lives of a lot of people. And they don't do it, they don't do it loudly. They, they do it very quietly. They do it very subtly. They do it with how they live, not with what they say, not with what they do. And, and some of the things I've noticed is the people who are phenomenal leaders have a tremendous amount of empathy, feeling with, not feeling for, but feeling with. And if you have sympathy without empathy, you, you cannot be really effective in a leadership role. Until you, what is the old saying? If you walk a mile in another man's shoes, then you're a mile away in heavy shoes. No, you, you really understand what he feels like, what he's doing, where he's from in the process. The second thing that I noticed was that, that the people who were in a great leadership position, and I, I've been fortunate enough to meet six presidents of this, of this country uh, and have conversations, pretty intimate conversations with about four of them. Uh, and it's interesting that they have an awareness of the world around them an awareness of the world. They know what's going on around them. They're aware all the time. They don't watch a lot of news and they don't read a lot of newspapers. They read a lot, uh, but their awareness comes from projection as well as from receiving. Uh, they have a tremendous awareness of the world around them. Uh, the second thing, the third thing that I found, and these are not in any order, is that the great leaders are extremely tactful. Tact is the ability to know what to say and know how to recover when you've said the wrong thing. And it's probably going to happen more that you need to know how to recover from saying the wrong thing than it is from, from knowing what to say. 
But the people who are in a leadership role in virtually whether it's government or whether it's the church or whether it's anywhere seem to be extremely tactful and understand how to, how to be good at it. They have creativity, a lot of creativity. And they figured out early on, somebody taught them, I'm sure, that creativity is not innate. Uh, that was something I learned from Walt Disney. Uh, you're not born to be creative. You learn to be creative. It is a decision that you learn to become creative. And once you begin to think about becoming creative, you'll become really good at it because there's a lot of stuff that you can read that you can look at that teaches you how to do that. Disney also, Disney said that creativity is doing something new or doing something old in a new way. And there's a lot more money in doing something old in a new way than there is in trying to do something new every time. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, how do I improve what's going on? Or how do I eliminate it? I think there's probably more success in understanding how to eliminate than there is in how to improve. And the very best ones that I've ever, ever known, ever worked with, been mentored by, hung out with, were phenomenal listeners. Ah, oh, I'm just still amazed at how well people have taught themselves how to listen. Do you ever take a class in listening? They teach us speech, they teach us reading, they teach us writing, they teach us some thinking, but did you ever have anybody teach you how to listen? It's interesting to me because it is a very active process that can be learned. I know that I can get your attention back by changing the speed at which I talk. I learned to be an auctioneer a number of years ago so that I can increase the, decrease the speed all the time I'm giving a speech so that I can regain your attention for just a few seconds. But you know, even if I can talk at 450 to 500 words a minute, and I can, you can still think at 1,800 to 1,900 words a minute. So even though I'm talking faster than normal, you're still thinking five to six times faster than I'm talking. So your mind's all here taking care of some of this. I don't even have to finish the, because you know what I'm going to, before I even. <laughs> so the process of anticipation prevents us from listening effectively. Learn how to listen. I would highly encourage you to become a listener. The best salespeople are never the best talkers. The best salespeople are always the best listeners. Always. I mean, in every profession I've ever worked and seen, the people who are the best at it are professional listeners. Who do you turn to when you have a problem? Somebody that'll listen. If you have a friend that will listen, truly listen, you're blessed. Uh, we don't normally have very many friends who will listen completely with undivided attention. And, and we found that those people that were the greatest leaders were always values driven. They didn't compromise their values. Their compromise, their values were set, and they lived them every day. They didn't have to tell you what they were. You could see what they were by the way they did what they did. Sometimes you, sometimes you don't get accepted in certain organizations if you don't have their values, and that's probably good in the long run. Just make sure you don't compromise yours, whatever they happen to be, as long as they are based upon the realities that you know are real, are, are, are real in here today. The greatest leaders have unrealistic expectations. They expect a whole lot more than anybody else does. Their expectations are way high. I learned a long time ago as a professor that students normally gave me 80 to 85% of my expectations. And if I lowered my expectations to where they were performing, guess what happened to their performance? It dropped to about 85% of that. And if I raised my expectations well above that, guess what happened to their performance? It always went up. It always went up. So raise, ch challenge yourself. Raise your expectations. It's phenomenal what will happen. And I would tell your parents, your kids are going to turn out to be what you expect them to be. I would tell you that too. Your kids are going to turn out to be about what you expect. So the more you expect, the more you'll get. And there is a huge, huge amount of success predictability with how, what your expectations are of your kids and of your friends. And the last thing that I would tell you is they had total integrity. Total integrity. Did never compromise their integrity. If they told you they were going to do something, they did it. They never would, they, they don't do excuses. They don't even believe in excuses. They only believe in performance. Total integrity. When I tell you that I will, and I do, it's okay. Most people in business judge you often, judge you almost exclusively on reliability how often you do what you say you're going to do. It's okay to tell me no. It's not okay to tell me yes and not do it. I, I, I don't have time. I don't have time for you if you tell me yes, I will, and then you don't show up. So get in the habit of that. Get in the habit of thinking about that. Get in the habit of where success comes from. So what are, the, what are some of the concepts that seem to work? Failure is one of those. 
We don't learn very much from successes. We learn mostly from our failures. Uh, and people who have been most successful have failed a number of times in the process. I read a great little book one time a couple of years ago called Saints Behaving Badly. And it told the story of about 75 people who had been sainted, who had achieved sainthood. And they were horrible people before they converted, before they became, before they understood the value of where they needed to go. So, so not everybody starts off good, but everybody makes a conscious decision to stay that way or to move to a different lane. Now, the next thing is that, that there are mental models that control your world. And I would tell you to be, get in touch with your mental model. I think your mental model defines your world for you. I think your mental world defines business. I think it defines your personal values. I think you know in your mind what something's going to do. You have this mental model of what you think the world's going to be like. And, and it, it may not be correct, but I do know that business is either good or bad up here a long time before it is out there. I know that your relationships with other people is either good or bad here before it ever is there. I, I know that your relationship with God is either good or bad here long before it is out there, before that conversation takes place. So, so the whole idea of creating a mental model that's real. And make sure your mental models for business, whatever you decide to do, and for life, coincide with each other. I have a dear friend here in, in Houston who is a, she's an executive recruiter. She is the most phenomenal executive recruiter I've ever known in my life. I mean, she can place somebody as a, as a president of a company or a CEO or an executive or for whatever it happens to be. They, they contact her to do a search. I'm telling you, there's about a 99.723% rate that it's going to be successful. She knows exactly how to make it happen. So she can match people in jobs and people in careers and people. She's been married five times. <laughs> she has a totally different mental model for her personal relationships. She, she's recruiting in the wrong places. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty evident that she's recruiting in the wrong places. And I never, I mean, I love her to death, and I never understood how, how she could maintain, could be as good as she is at work and as horrible as she is in personal relationships. <laughs> so, the, the, so the next thing that, that you, the concepts you have to do is understand the system. Everything has a system. When you take a job somewhere, you spend some time just backing off and looking at the system. Just back off and look at the way people talk with each other. Back off and the way the look people interact with each other. It will define the system. The people who work within the system define the system. Never look at the organizational chart. The organizational chart simply tells you what the company looks like before the ball is snapped. If you can draw an organizational chart when the ball is in play, when there is a crisis, when all the wheels are coming off, Ah, uh, then you understand the system. And at the head of the system, or the center of the system, there's normally people that have longevity and those characteristics I had on the previous slide. You know, they have integrity, they are consistent, they don't, they're not geniuses, but they are very consistent with their lives. Know the system. And, and the next thing they'll tell you to do is that you have to give up control. You really do, it's hard, it's hard to do because you're now getting to the point where you have some control but you have to give up control as soon as you can, especially in business, especially out in the world. As soon as you give up control, you allow people to grow, to become, and when they can grow and become, then all of a sudden they're gonna enhance your ability to do that. I will tell you that always be, be curious. Creativity starts with curiosity. Understand that curiosity is what makes you what you can become. And one of the things I learned when I was in high school by a gentleman who taught me how to run a business was why should always proceed what or how? If you know how to do something and, how, and what you know how to do, the how is important to somebody, you'll always have a job. If you know what to do after that's completed to expand it, there's probably a chance for you in management. But until you understand why we're doing what we're doing, you can never control the system. You can never manage the process. You can never move to the top. So you stay in the middle or the bottom until you begin to think why. That's why five-year-olds are geniuses, because they're naturally asking why. Why always precedes what and how. 
In disagreement, discussion, and dialogue, I put those three words up there. I'm a word freak. I put those three words up there because, because I think they have a lot in common because they're different. I, I don't like the word discussion. Discussion comes from the same root as percussion and concussion. Uh, discussion means that I'm going to convince you. I'm going to change you. I have intent of what I'm going to have you think when our conversation is over. Dialogue is a better word. Dialogues just ramble. They go free. They move. They change. And you get a chance to ask questions. And the more questions you ask, the more effective you can be. I learned a long time ago from a mentor of mine that you never want to be the person with the answer. You can find people with answers everywhere. Become the person who writes the question. That's who's in charge. The one who writes the question always is the prof in charge of the class, always the person who's in charge of the process. Make sure you become the person who asks the question. Spend some time defining the question. I would tell you to do that. And make sure you set yourself up for unrealistic challenges. If you meet every goal that you place, then you're not thinking, you're not moving, you're not setting something up. Set yourself some stretch goals really some stretch goes to become down the road. And learn to manage yourself. You can't manage anybody else until you can manage yourself. Once you can manage yourself, then life becomes a whole lot easier. And it's so easy to get in a, in a rut, to get in a process and stop managing yourself. It's also easy to blame somebody else for the whole process. And another takeaway that I had from Walt Disney was never sanction incompetence. Never, 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 never sanction incompetence. Never allow anybody that's around you to be incompetent. If they don't know how, you help them become, you help them get there, you help them teach, but never put up with incompetence. Students, still that way today as they were when I started teaching probably 40 something years ago, hate team projects. There's always one idiot on the team that never shows up for a meeting, never does anything. It's just totally worthless. And you see him the night before the presentation. I'm sorry, I'm working three jobs. I got all this stuff going on in that time. I'll do the PowerPoint. I'll make the presentation. What do you want me to do? And we carry that guy, you know, instead of saying, well, we've talked it over and we think you ought to die. <laughs> And we've put together a plan to help you accomplish that because it seems you can't do much. But we don't do that. We don't do that. We carry, no, we, we not only carry our wounded, we carry our dead. You got to get out of that. You got to get to the point where you choose not to sanction incompetence. You can't let that happen. So 10 important things that I learned from my students and have tried to, uh, tried to embrace. I, I went through a period teaching over here. I taught incoming freshmen and graduating seniors uh, for about 20 years in, in industrial distribution. Uh, and, and that's my two favorite groups, and I like to see what happened between the two. But anyway, uh, for, the, for the graduating seniors, I went through a time my wife called pseudo-creativity. It wasn't, uh, she just, she harassed me for it. But I did things different in the classroom. For example, I told them in the first exam, uh, this is the first exam, and we're going to do it a little bit different. Uh, cheating on this exam is not helping somebody. So if somebody needs, your, needs to ask you a question, y'all need to confer about that because that's what you're going to do when you leave here. I mean, you're going to spend your rest of your life working things out together. So I'd like you to work together on this exam. Wouldn't do it. They simply would not. It's like one of these kinds of deals, you know. Quite a change. They couldn't make it happen. I told the seniors one semester, I said, you know, let me tell you how we're going to do things. I know what you want to know. Two things. Is it going to be on the exam? And number two, how we're going to be graded. So I'm going to tell you that about a third of your grade is going to come from a combination of material from the lecture and from the textbook and from the notes that I'm going to pass out. Uh, and about a third of your grade is going to come for a pro project that you're going to do in class, in class, not outside. We're going to do it all in class. And then a third of, of your grade, and probably it may come up to be 40% to 50% of your grade, is going to be uh, impress me. And they, somebody said, what do you mean? And I said, impress me. It's, it's going to be at least 40% of your grade. <laughs> w what do I do? I said, I don't have a clue, but very good. Because it's, <laughs> it's going to be 40% of your grade. And somebody said, won't you just make us read like six books and give us a hard exam? I said, no. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you it's got to be good because it's going to be part of your grade. And once they got over the trauma and the stigma and realized one of the girls in the back said, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to make us think, aren't you? You can't do that. 
And I said, I know it's going to be tough, but I think I can. We're going to stay with this. But during this whole process, one of my students came to me. At the time, I was finishing a dissertation, and I, was, I made 72 keynotes around the world that year while I taught classes, and I never missed a class. Uh, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you. Everybody's stupid occasionally, okay? And I happened to be there that semester. So she said for her project that semester, for her creative project, she said, I need about an hour and a half with you alone. And I said, okay. Uh, she said, Sunday afternoon after church, maybe 2.30, can I pick you up at your house? And I said, sure, be glad to. So she came to the house and picked me up, and she was a bright, bright, bright child. And, and so we get in her car, and we're doing small talks. She drives to the cemetery. Uh, College Station Cemetery over on Texas, and we get out of the car. She had a picnic basket, and in the back there were two brand new graves uh, that had just been dug and just been, the funerals were the, like the day before, and she spread a blanket on the ground under the tree between these two graves, and she said, please sit down, and I'm going to talk to you about your choices in life. Wow. And by the time, <clears throat> excuse me, I still get choked up. By the time she got through with me, I made some real serious decisions about what was important. I've never forgotten that. And so students have come up with, with things that they have told me about what they believe makes the difference to them, and it's really made a huge impact on me. And in the 10th century, a guy named Toma, a, friend, a, a Greek guy, said, have a mind that's open to everything but attached to nothing. Have a mind that's open to everything but attached to nothing. That's about the only way you can grow. And one another thing that goes along with that is pessimism versus optimism. We don't have enough information to be a pessimist. We need to learn more before we decide to be pessimistic, you know? You don't really have time to be a pessimist. You don't really have enough data to be a pessimist. Life's too short to dance with ugly women. Life's too short to dance with ugly men. Life's too short to drink cheap wine. We don't get another shot at this. Why wouldn't we just, I mean, I know the next life's going to be better, but why shouldn't we enjoy this one and set higher expectations and become something else? Some people spend their whole life looking for ways to be offended. You know people like that. They, they look for ways to be, somebody's making fun of me. Somebody's harassing me. Somebody, well, why don't you maybe think about what you could do that's positive? You don't have time to hang out with people like that. And as I mentioned before, I won't beat you up over it. It's expectations drive outcomes. Life will turn out to be about what you expect. Expect it to be. Your relationships will be the same way. Abraham Lincoln said one time, the greatest freedom that you have is choice. The greatest freedom that we have in this country is choice. Nobody can make you mad unless you choose to let it happen. Nobody can change your life in the, in the wrong direction unless you choose to make it happen. So the choices that you make will determine virtually everything that happens to you from tonight forward. The second thing they told me was you can't give away what you don't have. For example, the universal law of attraction says you get from the world what you give the world. I believe that totally. So if you give hate and despair and fear, you'll get hate, despair, and fear. If you give love and opportunity, that's what you'll get. You will always get from the world what you give to the world. God said that a couple of thousand years ago. He said it about 19 different times uh, in the, through, all throughout the New Testament. It's, it, the, the, it, the law is there continually. Another way to say it is love simply live generously, care deeply, speak kindly, and leave the rest to God. The next one is there's no such thing as a justified resentment. There should never be a justified resentment. There is no resentment in your life. You have a limited blame from everything that happens. Doesn't matter who caused it. It only matters how do I fix it. So when you become the one that fixes it, not the one who determines who caused it, not the one that says your fault, your fault, your fault, yeah, then when you become the fixer, then you'll be amazed how many people in the world want to hang out with you, want to pay you a lot of money. They will throw money at you. And resentment blinds you to the possibility of reality. Resentment allows you to not think. Resentment consumes your brain, consumes your time. Get over it. Get away from it. it they cause physical pain as well as, uh, uh, as well as emotional pain. The next one is don't die with your music still in you. Oh, it's huge. We all walk to a different drummer. Thoreau said that very well. It's okay. It's okay not to walk to a drummer at all. The idea that, uh, 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 of being different is fine. What's worse is to have good ideas and never try them. 
what the worst thing you can do to yourself is to have a thought, have an idea, and not act on it. Now, some of them don't need to be acted on, but, to, to, but to not, oh, nobody would go for that. Don't do that. Make sure that, you, that. make sure that you don't give yourself the opportunity to not perform. And failure is usually caused by the fear of failure. Oh, it ha- all, I've seen it all my life. People who fail are afraid they're going to fail. They know they're going to fail. They've already determined they're going to fail. Uh, and so failure is a result of predetermination, and it's a result of expectations. So uniqueness is great. It happens with the greatest people in the world. Embrace silence. Spend time with yourself. As I said a while ago, if you don't like you, nobody else will. Find a place to go scream. Find a place to go just be with you for a while. And if you don't have a place just to get out and scream and, and, and holler loud at nobody at all, it's hard to release some of the emotions. You'll be amazed how much better you'll feel if you find a place to go scream. And, and learn to meditate. Learn to pray. One of my favorite sayings about prayer was Mother Teresa was asked one time, uh, right before she died, how, how, what do you say when you pray? And she said, I don't say anything. I just listen. And they said, and what does God say to you? And she said, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. Wow, that's powerful. He doesn't say anything. He just listens. Cool. It's amazing. Solutions, spirituality, God consciousness, ideas, and truth always come to you during quiet times. Make sure that you embrace, that you use, that you pursue quiet times. And as I've told you about 50 times, learn to listen. It's huge. And have a place to go scream. The next thing that's just kind of a universal law among the guys who were, the, who were probably the leaders that I've come across is that give up your personal history as soon as you can. Uh, get over it. Whether it's an award, all, all degrees ought to be have indelible ink on the back that says this in no way entitles the bearer to a job. You know, once you graduate, you'll look back and say, even I could do that. You know, there can't be a whole lot to it. Degrees only impress people who don't have them. My wife required that when I hung my diplomas on the wall in my office that I also put my seventh grade track ribbon. ribbon. I came in third in the seventh grade in a track meet, and there were only three of us running. Uh, but I got, a, I got a white ribbon for that, and she insisted it be in the middle of all my diplomas and all, the, all that stuff that hangs on the wall. You got to get over it. You got to be able to move away from it. Otherwise, you'll never be able to move to the next level. And one of the things that said a lot of people, but Stephen Covey, I think, said it best. You are not a product of your environment. You are a product of your decisions. You truly are. You are a product of your decisions. And from this day forward, it will certainly, certainly become even more true. And so we're made wise not by the reconciliation, or recollection of our past, but responsibility of the future. And as Shung Tao said, happiness is the absence of striving for happiness. Two things, I'll go, I'll move faster because we're about to run out of time. You can't solve a problem with the same mind that created. That's another Einstein saying. And so you have to either change the problem or you change the person that says it. And that, those letters, I don't know if you can see them from where you are. I apologize for the size. But it's uh, an acronym. The first letters are the following words. People learn what they want to learn when they want to learn it. You can never force it. Nobody can force it on you. You can't force it on anybody else. People learn what they want to learn when they want to learn it. So you have to create an environment that makes people want to be part of it, makes people be part of what you're doing. They want to share what it is that you're, that you're enthused about, that what it is that you learned, that what it is you want to do. And you have to learn how to unlearn. I used to think that 60% of what you learn at the university is worthless. That number is way too low. What you really learn is how to learn and learn how to unlearn in the process. Learn what's not relevant. And and you you get to the point where you don't have to regurgitate, where you can think. And one of the greatest hindrances to learning is teaching. I believe the more teaching is done, the less learning takes place. Uh, H.L. Mencken once said that what we've done with education in this country is we've turned a beautiful meandering stream into a straight concrete ditch so that everybody plays the same game the same way and there's no challenges and there's no learning and there's no no chance of you becoming something else. This is a great time to, for you to be alive. Wow, the next three years are going to be the most phenomenal time to leave college and start a career that's, that's happened in the last 75. It is amazing what the world is waiting for. 
And you'll be amazed that you'll be better equipped to handle it than you can even imagine. And the last thing on that group is that effort never outranks, oh, one more, effort never outranks performance. It was always a problem with my students because they always thought that if they worked really hard, they should be rewarded for that. I'm not one that believes that everybody gets a trophy for showing up. I will tell you right now, when you go to work, nobody cares how much sweat's on your brow. Nobody cares how many hours it took. Nobody cares how hard it was. They want to know, did you do it? Because when you begin to expect and pay for performance, you'll get performance. If you don't expect and pay for performance, you'll only get effort. And I'd say look for unity, not diversity. Uh, the next to the last one, and that is treat yourself as if you already are what you want to become. You have to start living like that. You have to start being that long before you achieve it. So you start early. There was a book written, a series of books written in the, in the 80s and 90s called Inner inner skiing, inner golf, inner whatever. And, and what they really said was, you got to see yourself doing it before you can do it. I used to tell my students, I believe there's a direct correlation between the number of times you see yourself walking across the stage at Reed Arena, getting your diploma, shaking hands, and then walking over and drinking the president's water and then walking off the stage. There's a direct correlation between the number of times you see yourself doing that and the probability of it happening. The more times you see it, the higher probability of it taking place. So what do you dream about? Make sure that you control your dreams. Make sure that you look inside. And make sure you hang out with positive people who you don't have time for that. You really don't have time to hang out for people that are negative. And get, get rid of negative influences. Uh, and as I said, see it as it's already happened. And, and the, the last one, I'm going to talk about that before we leave. And that is, I'm, I'm a word freak. I'm a, I'm a reading freak. I made myself a promise in 1980 that at least for the next 20 years, I was going to read a book a day. Uh, and I did. I didn't, that's not true. I rarely got 365, but I never fell below 350 a year. I, I don't know how in the world you can ever become anything of any value to anybody else unless you can read maybe a book a day or so. I used to tell my students, you ought to read a book a day, and they looked at me like, you're an idiot. And I said, well, you ought to read a book a week. I mean, that's only 52 books a year. A nine-year-old kid with a bad knee can, can read a book a week. Come on. Now, read a book that you want. And they looked at me like I was an idiot. And I said, well, read a book a month. They even have clubs for people who are in the slower group who, who, read, a book, who read a book a month. So get in the habit of that. And they looked at me like I was an idiot. And I said, read a book. <laughs> I don't care how long it takes. Read a book. And I'm going to tell you, I have not finished a business book in 40 years. <laughs> By the time you get through the first 70 pages, they've said everything they're going to say, and the rest of it is repetition of what they've already told you and justifying their reason. So you don't have to finish one. Pick and choose. Get in the habit of doing that. Wisdom is avoiding all thoughts that weaken you. The ancestor to every thought, to, pardon me, to every action is thought. And as Einstein said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And wisdom is also a key ingredient to longevity. And wisdom is not about age. Wisdom is about capacity, not what you have, what you use. How much of the capacity you have to make good decisions. I know some very, very, very wise 19-year-old people. I know some very, very unwise 80-year-old people. Some people who never took the time to think about the futurity of their decisions, the importance of their choices, the direction that they want to go. It's not about age. It's about capacity. It's about the ability to try. And the last one I'll tell you is that treasure your divinity. It's huge. It took me a lot of years to figure out how important that was. Uh, but then you get to the point where you begin to treasure the fact that God loves you. It's really the fact that you are unique, that he only made one of you, uh, and that whole thing is for you to do something unique. You can do something that helps. And when you choose to do that and you understand and begin to look at your uniqueness, you'll be amazed at how much better you get at what you do. You'll become what you choose. I promise you will. You will become what you choose to become. Don't choose a company to go to work for based upon what they do or what product they manufacture or sell. First, look at the people you're going to be working with. First, look at who you're going to hang out with, because you're going to be with them for at least a third of your life and maybe more. And if you don't want to be with them, you're going to be miserable wherever you happen to be, wherever you happen to go. So make sure that you choose very carefully. Never reject yourself or your thoughts. 
and you have to give yourself pep talks. Once in a while, you got to look in the mirror in the morning and say, I am pretty darn cool. You know, it's okay. I can do this. I can handle this. You can do this. And you have to do that. You have to tell yourself that on occasion. And remember that God loves you. Uh, one of my favorite words is enthusiasm, which is God within. That's what the word enthusiasm means, God within. Enthusiastic people always seem to have God within that they're willing to share. And from one of my favorite books that I've read about two dozen times, Alice in Wonderland, uh, the Mad Hatter said, how you get there is where you'll arrive. Oh, think about that. How you get there is where you'll arrive. That will determine where you wind up, what you do, what you practice, what you become. I'll leave you with the 10 most powerful two-letter words I've ever found. Uh, and I would ask you to commit those to thought. If it is to be, it's up to me. You can't wait on somebody else to do that. If there's going to be change, if there's going to be reality, if it's going to involve you, it's going to be left up to you to do it. Okay, I left, what do we have, 10 minutes? Do we have 10 minutes for questions and answers? Abby can answer any question you can ask on any subject in the world. And it's, <laughs> it's agreed to do so for cash. Uh, large bills, she wants nothing smaller than a 20. Questions? Who has a question? Answer. Oh, yes, ma'am. Do you have any podcasts or books? I'm sorry? Do you have any, like, books or podcasts or YouTube channels? No, I don't have any magic formulas. I do have a book list that I put on my website. I've not, I took it off. Pardon me? You have a website? Yeah. Uh, and I, I took my book list off about two months ago because the people weren't looking at it anymore, but I can put it back up there, and I will. Uh, but I try, I don't read as much as I used to, but I still do, I still do 100 a year. Uh, and, and I'll tell you some really, there's some good stuff out there. And I vary. I mean, I'll read novels, and, and I'll read trash, and, and I'll read inspirational books. And, and, and I, I was given an assignment about 15 years ago by a lady in our Sunday school class here at the church. Uh, we were having a discussion about something, and somebody said, the Bible says, and somebody said, no, it doesn't. It says, and, and then she said, whose Bible? How do we get the Bible that we have? Where did it really come from? So she turned to me and she said, uh, you think you're kind of a researcher. I'd like for you to figure out how we got the Bible we have today. Just share that with us. So that's, that's 14 years ago. 14 years and 3,200 typewritten pages later, uh, it's become almost consuming for me to look at the history of and, and, and the evolution of. And I'll tell you, when I first started reading and first started studying, I started finding things wrong. And if you want to find something wrong, you don't have to look very far, you know. But then something happened, and I started finding things right. And the Bible became huge. It became big. And, and, and it moved me to the point where I have three Bibles, if I want inspiration, I'll read the King James Version. If I want information, I'll read the New International Version. And, and if I want to say, what? I'll read like the good news from Modern Man or something like that. But, but I read at least three or four different Bibles because I get a different perspective from each one of them. Uh, if I had to give you the top ten books I've ever read, I couldn't. I was wondering if you like the written book or if you have any like recorded podcasts. I do not. Uh, I, don't, I don't. I've just... No, I, I used to do a, I do a lot of seminars, do a lot of presentations, but all for business, and they all record them for themselves, but I've never sold them. And I want you to notice that if you want a copy of the slides, you're certainly welcome to them. You'll notice there's no copyright symbol anywhere on anything you saw tonight. I stole all this from somebody else. <laughs> and, and, and I would expect you to do the very same thing, and if it looks good, put your name on it. Take credit for it. Uh, tell them that, that you thought this up one night when uh, you were there. Yes, ma'am. Lindsay. I, yeah, well, uh, I'll tell you an experience that I had. I got on an airplane one day uh, in Palm Springs going to Dallas. I had done a keynote in Palm Springs, and I got on the airplane. It was a, uh, an MD-80 going to Dallas, and, and there's, there's six seats in first class. And because I flew, because I have almost 10 million miles 
uh, in the air. I, I don't. I realized that there's seats behind those curtains. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know where those people were going when they went back there. So anyway, I'm sitting in first class and we're delayed for two or three minutes. And, and right at the very end, this limo pulls up and four guys got out and get in the plane and set, all set in first class. They all have on, they all have on suits, nice suits. And, and I thought, okay, we'll go now. And there's two empty seats left. And, and then another limo pulls up and Gerald Ford, who was the president, uh, he, he, was no, he was former president, but he and his secretary got off and came on the plane. They were flying to Dallas. And there was an empty seat beside the window uh, and an empty seat on the other window. And the secretary said, you, you will sit over here. And he said, you mind if I sit by you? And I said, no, that would be fine. <laughs> so for two hours and 22 minutes, uh, we talked the whole time. Phenomenal man, amazing. I asked him why he pardoned Nixon. Uh, and he told me. And I asked him the coolest thing about the job and the hardest thing about the job. And he said the most difficult thing about the job to him was that whatever decision you make as president of this country, you know you'll never live long enough to know if it was the right decision. Because it will be determined 100 years or two years later whether or not you made the right decision. Uh, and he said the coolest thing was the building next door to the White House is called the OAOB, the Old Administrative Office Building. That's where the vice president's office is. And in the basement of the OAOB is a library. And there's a tunnel from the White House that goes to the OAOB. And in the, in the basement, the library is handwritten notes from all the presidents. And they're categorized so that if you have a problem you're thinking about, you can go see what somebody else wrote about that. Pretty cool. He had some really neat ideas. He challenged me. He said, what do you think is the biggest problem with the university system today? And I said, well, I think one of our biggest problems is the tenure system. Because we have people teaching from the same notes they took in 1946 when they didn't pass the class anyway. And we're expected to memorize and regurgitate that as if it's got value. And he said, so you think tenure is really a bad thing? And I said, yes. And he, then he leaned over toward me and he said, and, and what have you done to change that? Mm. Well, I have it. <laughs> Does that count? You know, so, so uh, you know, it kind of gave me goosebumps to, to talk to people. But, he, you know, Lee Iacocca, uh, who was at Chrysler uh, back in the 50s and 60s, was good. Jack Welch, who was the CEO of General Electric. I did a lot of work for GE uh, in the 80s when Jack Welch was just kind of slowing things down at General Electric. Uh, and and he, he, was, he was a good friend. He, he died about five or six years ago. And, uh, so I've, I've been very lucky. I've, I've spent some time with Jimmy Carter, who was a uh, now we're just now figuring out that he was a good president during the time that he was in office. Everybody thought he was an idiot, you know, and the same with Gerald Ford. Uh, and so anyway, I've got, I've got to spend some time with presidents and mostly CEOs. Uh, but I tell you, the two people who probably had the biggest influence on me personally were Walt Disney and, and Mike Vance. Mike Vance was his director of creativity, his right-hand man for about 20 years. Vance was a Congregationalist minister before he went to work for Disney. And uh, uh, he had more ideas per second than I have in a lifetime. Uh, I was just amazed at this guy. He was phenomenal. What a, what a person. But you know what? Those kind of people are everywhere around here. I mean, we have Nobel Prize winners in this congregation. Uh, we have people who will win the Nobel Prize that haven't yet in this congregation. Uh, we have a gentleman in this congregation who did the first embryo transplant who did the first carbon copy of a cat, the first test tube animal, came out of, out of a gentleman who's in my Sunday school class. Uh, and, and, and he's done lessons in our class about, uh, about the ethics that go with that. What happens when you begin to think about, you know, and he said, it's, uh, it's tough, it's, it's really tough. And I asked him one day, I said, how, how do you justify that? He said, I think God gave me the brain to do that with. And as long as I don't use it for anything that's destructive and can be creative, then I think he's going to reward me, enhance me for doing that. And I guess you have to rationalize that to yourself, you know, that different way. But, but, but authors, uh, Stephen Covey was a good friend of mine who wrote one of my favorite books, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, and, uh, and he and I did some work together. I got a chance to meet Billy Graham on three different occasions. Uh, we shared a podium one time. Uh, Zig Ziglar, who's a motivational speaker, and I shared a podium a number of times. And so uh, I, I, I go back to the first thing I started whenever Abby asked how much of it's luck, most of it. 
Most of it's being at the right place at the right time. And most of it comes when somebody shows you how to take advantage of what's around you, this awareness. I could never overemphasize you to you to, to become more aware of what's going on around you. There's brilliance all over this part of the world right here. So get in touch with it. I know you have things to do. We've got time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Why did I choose A&M? Uh, you got an hour? Well, let me tell you, I, I chose A&M. A&M was chosen for me. Uh, and, and here's the deal. I went to West Texas A&M undergraduate, uh, and I went in the Navy, uh, spent four years in Vietnam. I really did put cram four years of college into 10. I got out of the Navy, and I had a wife and a, and a child, and, and, uh, and I stopped at West Texas A&M to just to look at it, and the major professor there, the head of the department, he and I, he's my best friend today, I guess. We still hang out together constantly. But anyway, he said, uh, well, you need, to, you need to consider this, and he kind of helped me and guided me and mentored me through the process. Uh, and then whenever I got ready to graduate, he said, uh, don't interview, because he said, I'm, you're going to A&M to get a master's, and you're going to come back here and start a program and distribution for me. I'm not asking your opinion. Uh, I, I found a place for you to rent while you're down there, and here's what you're going to do. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, and then what I did, and then I spent some years back there on the faculty, and then he said, okay, it's time to go get a Ph.D. Uh, and I said, yes, sir. Uh, and so we do that. So it was really chosen for me. I, I got lucky. You know, I think there's probably three decisions that are made from most people, by most people, on a motion uh, that shouldn't be. One is where they go to school. Uh, normally, kids choose universities based on where their friends are and what they think the football team does. And, and you know, that kind of stuff that's really irrelevant to the whole world. Uh, and, and the second decision is uh, what they major in. Uh, a lot of folks figure out what they don't like, and most of us go down that path, and they finally, hopefully, wind up in something that works. And then you figure out that degrees only impress people that don't have it. It's what you do with it that matters. And the third one, uh, I think the extremely important decision is who you marry. And that's also an emotional decision. It shouldn't be. There should be a whole lot more logic in that decision than most people use. But, but you couldn't sit down with a date and say, okay, I've got this checklist. I'm going to go down about you. There's some things I don't really like. I love you the way you are, but here's what I want you to change. Uh, and I want you to do it immediately, you know. So, so we don't use enough logic. We don't put enough thought into it. Uh, we got lucky. That's where luck really comes in the whole process. We got God. That's, that's, that's more important than luck almost every time. I thank you very much for taking this hour out of your life to spend with me. It's an honor that you would do that. Good to be with you. Hope we can get again sometime, okay? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.